Good evening everyone, how are you? How's things? Hope you're all really, really well. And for once tonight, my macros are actually working Good. and they are running. Do you know what's funny? Your macros are working, but my end but is your not. Chat's not. <laughs> that's, that's because you decided at one minute two to start setting up the chat. <laughs> really? Do you, do, do you really want to get into this right now? Uh, we the can. The joys of it. Um, how are you guys? How was your New Year's? Hope yous, um, you know, didn't drink too much, didn't get too merry. Um, hope you've had a great time, downtime with the family, whatever else was going on in life. We actually had a weekend away on the weekend, which, which is, is absolutely yes. epic, wasn't it? it very, was awesome. very lovely. Um, what's it called? A big, I wanted to have a shout out to a couple of people, but one person in particular was Neville Hackett. Um, because the other day he managed to perfect a bunny hop, which was absolutely amazing. Um, I'm not sure if Neville actually knows how it came about, but it's basically come about because he's put so much effort into his clutch control and, and the other little bits and pieces, body timing and all the other things. So absolutely well done, Neville. Um, jump in the comments if, if we ever get to that point and let us know what your goal is for this year. So we're going into the new year. Um, I'm sure plenty of you have either an event or a technique or Blackwood. a competition. Blackwood for you, is it? Blackwood and getting my final 10 degrees back in my knee. Yes. So, that which we're almost there. I find out on Monday. Yay! Nearly there, nearly there. And also, I'd like to shout out to the guys who popped in tonight, Richard and Sue and Darren, and, um, and also Brad and Martin for stopping by and saying hi. So we do do these live from the Motor Dynamics shop. So if you ever want to stop in, join in, be a part of it, do jump in, come say hi, all that jazz. Um, so just to give people a little heads up, I will be jumping from screen to screen because I can't get into re-screen and re-screen. Ah, I feel like screaming uh, into re-stream. So I am doing it straight from Facebook and hopefully on Instagram if I can't take your computer. On YouTube, you mean? You, so, oh, that's it, YouTube. Well, we're, going, we're going good here. So I'm going to type in a message Oh. because you can work off mine. Oh, I can. Um, we'll work across each other. Anyway, tonight we are talking about um, obstacles and, and in many ways, that's why I'd like to know what's your biggest goal for this year? For, because a lot of people come to us for specifically for obstacle riding. It's, it's what we get the most and then it, it starts out this way. And then to be honest, the question of, um, the question of what is your, uh, what, you know, how do you ride obstacles is the question that I get more than anything at all. And to be honest, it's a little bit of a bane of my existence. It's probably the hardest question to, to answer because from most riders' perspective, they, they think it's a very simple request. They think it's something, you know, it's small, it's easy, it's just riding over a log. And, and quite often people will be coming from a point where they, they have ridden obstacles before and they feel they can ride logs to a certain height and rocks to a certain height or whatever. Unfortunately, from a coaching perspective, a lot of the time it's more the bike doing it at times. And, and when people ask a question like that, or how do I ride obstacles, or, or I'm having this problem doing this particular technique, it opens up a myriad of other questions and it doesn't, it's not just one thing, it's not a short answer. Um, but in one way tonight, I'm gonna to try and I'm gonna hopefully, you know, very generally brush over this. <laughs> I'll go across it as lightly and simply as possible because ultimately there is a pattern in all obstacle riding that is, that's present and it's something I've been working on for absolutely years in my coaching and it's something we've been refining year on year on year. And if you get this pattern in place, essentially it's, it's like an automatic switch. It's a button you can press 
and things will happen. So if you, if you develop this technique and you put it in place and you automate it in your brain so it's absolutely dialed in your head, um, you'll call on it just as muscle memory. It'll just happen for you and you won't have to think about it. This is largely why a lot of top riders struggle to explain it and put it into words because it just happens. And they'll say, just, you know, just ride in and rev it and, and do this. But there's, what, what people don't realize is there's 20 years of development or 10 years of development that's got, got them to that point. So it isn't that simple. Um, it's a bit like when you say, um, when people say to you, Jess, how did you put that f arrangement together so beautifully, so simply know, and it, easily? It, it, you only took five minutes, but you charged so much. Mm. Well, that's because I spent four years studying on how to put it together for five minutes. <laughs> exactly that. And put all my time in. pressure assessments. So, um, I need to jump back here. Oh, okay. Because this is going to get really, <laughs> really confusing for us. So I am, um, this one. Going to jump to camera two. Oh, oh it's oh. all shut down. Okay, so there is there is only three techniques, okay, when it comes to riding obstacles. There is ride technique, there is the splat technique, and punching. Okay, that's like this? Yeah, exactly. There's there's you can blend those, you can, you know, you can use them in different ways, but really fundamentally there's only the three techniques. Um, there is double blip, which um, is a separate thing together, but that's just ride technique, but not using the clutch. Um, and double blips come about from many years back when, when riders didn't use the clutch at all. Their clutches weren't good enough to be used to accelerate on the clutch. Um, they would accelerate on the throttle and they would, use, they would ride obstacles purely on the throttle. And there'd be two blips, one to lift the front wheel above the obstacle and a second one to drive the back wheel in. And essentially that's where the term double blips come from. I don't use it, I refer to ride technique, splat or punch, one of those three techniques. So the first one up is ride technique. Now the focus on this is just to get the back wheel to drive into the obstacle and drive all the way up the face of the obstacle. So I'm gonna to cut to camera two. Um, hopefully all of my workflow still is in place. Cut to camera two, and this one here, you'll see if you watch closely, the back wheel is gonna drive all the way up the face of the obstacle here. It just feels so odd not to hear the sound. It's like <laughs> the sound of everyone silence. Everyone else should be able to. So you can see here that when we take it back, Oh, do it in reverse again, because that was pretty cool. For those of you in reverse, <laughs> For those of you at home, you should have the audio there. So for the first portion of this, you can hear the RPM is nice and high. So the RPM has risen up. And then as we drive into the face, you'll notice that I'm pulling on the bars, pushing with the legs, ignore the front wheel hitting. That's kind of irrelevant, but the it does help in situations, but it doesn't matter for the overall technique description. And then the back wheel, it gets some lift, but it's touching all the way to the bottom and all the way up the face. Um, bike goes up, bike goes back. Bike so goes that, one, <laughs> that one is the ride technique. And it's, it's not about trying to jump the bike in the air. It's not trying to get enormous lift. We're not trying to see how high the back wheel can leap into the air. It is literally riding the face of the obstacle. And that is... 90% of all obstacles you'll ever come across, that technique is more than adequate. I would suggest that probably 90% of riders, that's the only technique that they need, even though many riders do come for us for the punch technique and, and whatnot, as we, as we see in a minute. The next technique is the splat technique. Now, splat is essentially the ride technique, but taken to a greater level, a much higher level. There's more RPM, um, there's, there's more effort, more pull, more push, more of everything essentially to, to push the bike upwards more, to create more lift. And the back tire still, we're not trying to jump the back tire to the, to the obstacle. We're trying to get it to the face of the obstacle as early as possible. And we want to use the face of the obstacle to get traction and continue up the face so of the So that's where you get your splat the obstacle. from, because you so want the tire to essentially splat against into the it. object. Exactly. We're not mm -hmm. trying to jump to the top. If, if there's a kicker or like a little rock or something you can jump off, well, yeah, you might jump to the top, but that's using a kicker, using a ramp. Um, this is purely splat Splatting technique. So I will object. jump to camera two and 
I'll need to rewind it because I've, I've set it up the wrong way. Drag this back here, like just because back. you like it going, Yep. you like watching it going backwards. So here you'll watch, I'm going to get a little bit of lift with the back tire, lots of RPM, squat down, and then a big go, and the back wheel extends out to the face and drives all the way up. Now, the, the, like I said, the, the key thing here is we're not trying to jump to the top of it, we're trying to get the bike going upwards, um, accelerating toward the top, but the back wheel, we want it to extend out to the face. So technically as early it's as possible. only your back wheel that touches it, your front wheel has nothing to do with it? Or um, is that just because you're a bit fluky in this one? Fluky, that wasn't fluke. <laughs> I'm deeply and emotionally scarred by that. <laughs> Well, it looked pretty freaking me. When you're splatting, there's far less focus on the front hitting. So in the yeah. ride technique, I, I noticed the front, that the did touch it. It a did bit. touch, but like I'd mentioned, you might not have heard. It's it doesn't matter. No, if it I touches. was ignoring you at that stage. The ride technique, the front wheel can touch. It can completely miss the obstacle. Um, you might start with the front wheel on top and be stationary. With the splat technique, the front may touch on the way through. Sometimes you, you're so close to an obstacle that your front is actually going to touch on the way through. And um, sometimes that's just the reality, the nature of the, of the obstacle that you're approaching and your setup and everything else. Um, so those are those, those two techniques. The key bit is, is that, and essentially in both of them, we're trying to get the back wheel to the face as early as possible and maintain traction up the face. Um, and this, is, this actually harks on to a point where I, I'll mention in a minute. But the last technique, and this is the one that pretty much every enduro rider comes to me for, they want to punch Ooh, is this or the, jab zap. Is this the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? It, it really, it is to a certain extent, because it's going to take, it takes a long time to get to this point. And should, it, before they even get to this technique, should you go in, like, learn the ride technique? Let's, let's no, just am show, I, them, am show I everyone jumping first. A little bit too You're far jump, ahead. jumping I'm, ahead here. I'm jumping ahead. So I'll um, jump across to this one. Now, this one here is the punch technique, and this is where the front wheel lifts in the air, and we place it when I get to the actual bit where I'm riding. The front wheel gets lifted into the air, and we place it into the face of the obstacle, so it punches hard into the face, and the back wheel is gonna get a lot of lift. So if you watch this here, the front wheel will lift in the air, it's going to come down onto the log, and it will stop against the face of the log, and then the back's going to get lots of air and kind of land on top of it in a way. So in this point, with this technique, the, the idea is we're not trying to do that. Well, sometimes we are. We're trying to get lots of lift with that back wheel. But you'll, you'll notice, hang on, I'm not finished oh. with that. Um, you'll notice when me, 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 I me, take me. it back here, you'll... Uh, I need the mouse. <laughs> That's why. You, um, <laughs> Sorry. When I do this, if you watch the front wheel, the front wheel comes down and it stops hard. Like you can see here how compressed my forks are, how and compressed the front tire is, because we've pushed that front tire hard in. And then you'll watch a second later, the back wheel gets a heap of lift and then lands on, on top of the obstacle. So there you go. Oh, can I, can I do my bit now? You can take it back. Thank um, you. So those are the three techniques, ride, splat, and punch. And so many people will come to us wanting to punch technique or whatever, but it takes many years of development of timing of the clutch and the body movement and everything else to get into that. When, we, when I get riders who are, who are coming along and wanting to learn obstacles, there's also a hundred other things that affect what's happening and how we teach it and how we deliver it for the, for the riders and what they're doing. So, they might be on an adventure bike, they might be on a, a 300 two-stroke enduro bike, they might be on a four-stroke, they might be on a trials bike, they might be on an electric bike, they could be on anything. The levels of skill vary dramatically amongst riders. They might have been someone who's ridden purely on the throttle for 40 years and has never really used the clutch. Richard, <laughs> case in point, it's a very... Stop. Yeah. yeah, that's it. That's it. So many riders were taught just to start, like the clutch is purely start and stop and that's it. And a number of disciplines, racing disciplines will teach good technique in motocross and enduro 
don't quote me on this, is you know riding purely on the throttle and not touching the clutch. So a lot of people will be taught those things and those habits are in place. But for riding the obstacles, your clutch is absolutely everything. So there's, there's a whole heap of other things in there that you need to learn, you need to understand um, the line, the approach on the obstacle, setting up on the obstacles, there's a whole heap of things. But there, if we look really, really closely at it, there is an underlying pattern that's in place in all three of these techniques. And if you can learn that pattern, if you can train your brain to repeat that pattern without question, just instantly, you essentially have an obstacle riding automatic button. It's pre-programmed. You ride up to it and you can just do these and it will happen. And if you put, the, the one thing that I have learned in the, um, what, 20 odd years I've probably been coaching, how long have we been coaching Rich and Sue? I reckon when you first come down from Karatha, yeah. we started doing, doing things, which was probably 20 years ago. 23. 23 years ago, something like that. Um, I've, I've been coaching and helping riders since I was, say, 15, and I'm, what, 40, 40 One, this year? 40, 40 this year. You're 40, no, you're 41 not 40, in August. You're not 40 this year. You're not turning 40, you're turning 41. Yeah, exactly. But you said I was 41. I'm not 41. God. Well, you're close <laughs> enough to it. <laughs> anyway, um, so we've been doing this a long time, but all those, all those years, we've, we've, I've recognised that there is a pattern, a very clear pattern, and that is, in every one of these techniques, you need to be revving the bike, you need to then squat down on the bike, get squatted into the bike, and then there's a go action. Now, RSG, Rev Squat Go, if you've seen my logo on my on um, Neil Price Trials and Enduro Skills, um, you'll see that there is a, a, a bunch of arrows, and they literally mean RSG. So first of all, there's the curved arrow, which is your revving, an arrow pointing down for the squat, and then arrow up at an angle, which is the go, where some lift has been created and you and the bike are going that way and not that way into the obstacle. Thank you, wifey, for designing that logo. You did a very good job on that. Yeah, I am a touch biased on that, but mm -hmm. you did a very good job on it. Um, and these, these, these pattern is absolutely underpins everything. It helps with riding hills, riding creek beds. It, helps in all sorts of bridging gaps where you've got one tire on, on top of each obstacle, it's exactly the same. It helps absolutely big time in so many different places when you get this into place. So I'm just gonna talk through the action, talk through the process of kind of how we deliver it and why in just very simple terms. Um, and that'll give you an idea of where you, um, where you might need to work on or the, the process that you, you can use to put this into place for yourself and start improving and working towards riding obstacles properly for yourself. If you want to take this into absolute in-depth, you can join up with our online coaching community. I will, we have an app. I will put just, those details. You can just go to neilprice.com or either of the app stores and you can sign up there, but that, it does cost it's 160 Aussie dollars. I got confused the other day because one of the app stores is, is showing a different price somehow. I think it's a local tax or something in the US or something. But basically it's 160 Aussie dollars for a year's full access to it. But we will break these down in there and we deliver um, personalized feedback to you in those. Um, and we go far more in depth. But um, I'll go through these, these the three steps of this and explain why we've come to this absolute simplification to make it as easy as possible for riders to understand and to put into action. Before you go there, is there any comments? Because I need um, to have a drink. You need to have a drink. Well, um, we did have uh, Breno said that he thought the splat technique was the form of hitting the ground hard with your face. So he's like, damn, I've been doing it wrong all the time. And I'm like, well, thankfully, Neil's now here to save your face. So you won't have to do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, you see, I was, in, I was born a really pretty child. Now I'm just yeah, hit yeah. my face too many times. Um, yeah, your dad started that one when you were one. <laughs> um, now, Dan Evans said he liked the new tune to the... Um, oh, the intro. The, the intro awesome. tune. Awesome. And now something at the beginning, you were asking people what their goal was yeah, for the year. Yeah, what's the goal for the year? So, what are you doing? You might be, and if you haven't, if you haven't answered here, <sighs> jump in the comments and let us know because I would. There's lots of events. We've 
We've not had any events in Australia basically last year. So there must be some goal, some event you want to get to. Oh, well, I think everyone wants to get over here for the Nationals that is in true. October, yep. which would be great. Richard said he'd still like to be riding at the end of the year. Oh, I think you've got uh, a few years yet, Rich. <laughs> Sue said to ride better and finally get RSG. So that's a really good one yes. to work on. And awesome. someone has just randomly appeared on... A random spam comment. A random Gotta spam Gotta love that on YouTube. Comment. Yep. So, so the, to break this, this down, it is rev, squat, and go. Now, so simple, suck eggs concept, isn't it? So the first point is the revving part of it. And when we mean rev, we mean you need to be able to hold the RPM on and control and manage the speed of the bike on the clutch. So it's not just revving the bike. You need to be able to rev the bike and control the, the pace that you're moving at with the clutch. Now we need to keep the bike moving extremely slow because in an obstacle, speed is your enemy. The more, um, the more speed that you carry into the obstacle, the more you're gonna bounce back off the obstacle. The steeper the obstacle becomes, the slower you essentially have to approach. If it's, if it's not as steep and you need to carry some momentum longer, longer it's, it's not such a big issue, but when we get steeper and steeper obstacles, you need to be slower and slower into it because for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. If you come in fast into a square rock face, it's gonna throw you back just as fast. So all the energy going in is gonna equal energy out. So when we come in nice and slow, the, the revving is probably the most critical part. It does a whole heap of things. First of all, when you have the RPM there, we ride heavily on engine inertia. So you're going to have more power, instantaneous power to, to go at that moment in time and help create the lift. If you accelerate on the throttle as opposed to the clutch, it's a much slower acceleration. So if you graft it out, a throttle acceleration would look something like that, like you would see on a, on a dyno chart, something like that. Whereas a clutch acceleration is gonna be a big burst initially, and then it's gonna start tapering off as that inertia wanes off, and then it'll tend to plateau out as it, as it transfers from the, the flywheel energy and the engine power to just the engine power carrying through. So it's two, it's two very different ways to accelerate. If it's on the throttle, it's just not going to be fast enough. If you watch, I refer to this all the time, but there's a cracked video and it's of the megawatt hard enduro where they ride heavily on the beach in a couple of places. And if you watch those videos or the Romaniacs um, or trials fails, there's a bunch of trials fails videos online and you'll see people when they ride into obstacles and they're purely on the throttle, there's a couple of things that happen when they get it wrong. One is sometimes the front wheel doesn't lift enough and it just runs straight into the obstacle because they don't have a fast enough acceleration. The other thing is you'll see they'll carry speed into the obstacle. So if the front wheel doesn't lift high enough, they've picked up speed and they will plow into the obstacle, like literally headlong into it. If the front wheel clears the obstacle as they're picking up the speed, they end up propellering down the road. So they'll, they'll ride into it, they'll hit the obstacle with the back, the front's clear of the obstacle, and the bike will just spin around at center of gravity and, and go end over end down the road. The other one is, is the power will come up slowly if the obstacle's a bit of a ramp and they will, the bike, they'll let the bike go in front of them, the acceleration will be gentle and they'll get a little bit of front wheel lift. But then as they get into the power band of the bike, especially in enduros, they'll get onto the face of the obstacle. If there is traction, the bike will go up over their head because suddenly it's got into the power band and the bike's taken off and it's got grip on the face. If you're riding something like limestone, it'll go over their head. If they don't have traction, the front will spin and the front will plummet and they'll just drop front wheel first into the hole on the other side of the obstacle. So it's really important that we get off the throttle because on the clutch, when we use the clutch, we're gonna have the RPM available and then we're going to use the clutch for the acceleration. And when you do that, you can get the bike loaded before the step on the ground where there is some traction, where you've got dirt and something to bite on and you've got body weight acting down on the tire and we can release the clutch there with a very big burst of energy. But that energy is then going to dissipate and die down. And as your back tire hits the face, it's still going to be driving, but it's not going to be as aggressive as it was on the dirt. So you've got this big aggressive acceleration at the moment when you have weight on the tire, you have traction, and you need to overcome the inertia of your body and bike not wanting to move forward. 
and that gets lost in braking that inertia and pushing the bike forward. Then after that, that energy, it's still gonna be driving, but it's gonna be dampened and lessened as it hits the face. And if it is slippery, you're going to be able to find traction on the face more easily. If there is a lot of grip, the bike's not gonna aggressively whip over top of your head, and you should arrive to the top of the step comfortable, comfortably in one piece. So, with a few other bits and pieces in between. So that's an important reason why we um, rev the bike and we use the clutch to accelerate. So in, in trials, Joan Pons said to me, um, Joan Pons is a, a former, you know, world number three in trials and um, trials coach and he's trained Tony Bow and Albert Cabastani and Leia Sands and all them. And um, he always says to us, if you can control the clutch, you can ride trials. Hard enduro trials, it's purely clutch control. If you can, if you can control that, you're well in front. Um, do you need a breather? Yeah, I do actually. Is there some questions oh, or comments? Oh, well, not, que uh, not um, questions, but just people replying to your um, questions oh, in regards to what their goals for the year are. Yeah. So we had, um, if I go back up, um, I can't put it, David. David. Oh, I was trying to think of your name. <laughs> Mr. Grice. I'm sorry, David. Just call him Mr. Podcast. <laughs> Mr. Podcast. He wants to ride B grade and have a score that resembles, well, that. Uh, to not have a score that resembles a T2 cricket score. <laughs> uh, Patricia Chapman wants to improve skills. How are you going, Patricia? Um, we, I, yeah, anyway, I will be in touch. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Glenn Horn wants to find a balance point in the wheelies and to get over a downhill fear. Oh, so awesome. I know the downhill fear one because that was mine last year. Well, I'm sure I'm now going to have to re-get over that fear again when I get back on the bike. Yes. Well, what can happen? You've done the worst possible thing, haven't you? Well, that's true, but the only thing is, when I did the knee, I was going up a hill, not down a hill. So, <laughs> so you have a fear of uphill. <laughs> oh, I have a fear of going over rocks now, and that wasn't oh. even a rock; that was just like a pebble. Yeah. <laughs> um, is it Halen? Halen, yep. Uh, Halen wants to compete and finish every West event this year and beat the goat farmer Kel West in points. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm sure you know what that end part yes, means. Yes, yes, definitely. Looking forward to riding all the West events this year. It should be cool. And Scotty Chapman, hey Scotty, he said his goal is to finish the horse float and make it to an event. Yeah, definitely. Actually, so, we haven't seen you for a while, Scotty, have we? I know, but that horse float is looking pretty epic. So. It's absolutely looking awesome. Um, killer looking thing. Oh, wait, wait, there's, an, ooh, oh, there's oh, more. Oh, there's more. Oh, but wait, there's more. Wait, if there's you more. wait, I'll, I'll throw in some steak knives as well. <laughs> um... Oh, yes. Oh, so Dan Evans actually put up, um, thank you, Dan, saying that um, one of our community members, Tom Trantow, has released a review on the online coaching app and Dan has actually put the link in the Facebook Thanks a lot, comments. Dan. So thanks for that. I'll actually put those that link in the YouTube comments as well. And his goal is to complete a full trial season and see an improvement from last year. Loving it. So we've Hell got some yeah. good goals out there There's, this year. There is, there is. And I mean, I think after all the downtime we've all had, we, we, we've got no excuse this year, do we? Anyway, I, I put all my calendar together this year and it looks crazy. So hopefully, hopefully we can get some interstate travel because I'm really hoping to get across to a few grassroots. Not um, yet, it's still borders closed. Enduros and there's, I've got trials coaching in March, supposedly in, in Tasmania. And there'll be coach, we're going to be doing coaching in... Um, there's still room for me in the suitcase, right? I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Not the kids, just me. What's that? <laughs> yeah, we need the kids at home. <laughs> but he, we, we, I'm looking at doing coaching in Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania this year. So if you are um, in any of those states and interested, please do follow the page. All the stuff will go up on the, on the social pages. Anyway, back to the topic at hand. Squat. Now... Like I said, these have been simplified down. So the first, the first point is just the revving component, rev. And the next one is squat. Now, the reason why I say squat and I use the term squat is that you just need to get down to the start point. All you need to do is lower yourself to a start point. A lot of people get really focused on the preload side of things. And you'll have heard me say this before in one of the other videos that preload's not a term I like to use because when riders come in and, I say, and someone says preload the bike, that means people want to jump down. They want to force down on the bike. They feel they need to really push hard on the bike. 
but it, the, the process of getting down is not where the bike is going to be pushed to the ground. Now, yes, we do want to make the bike squat. We want to get it so the swing arm's squatted and the bike's down nice and low, and it's got all this load on the back tire. But jumping your body weight down is not the best way to go about it when you're starting out. It's fine when you are Tony Bow and you are looking for 300 mil at the top of a three meter rock step. By all means, go for it, preload the hell out of it because you're a way better rider than I'm ever going to be. But before you get to that point, you, it is if you start preloading, if you start jumping up and dropping down or dropping hard into the bike, which does benefit you if you do do it, it's going to throw out the timing of everything else that occurs out of that. And it's very hard just to time the go point, the clutch, the, the distance to the obstacle, the placement of the tyres, everything else. It's hard enough to judge all those things, let alone adding in a movement of your body upward and downward. So it's just making things excessively complex. Um, we've always trained just a single push into the bike and that's it, just, just getting down on the bike. Now that push into the bike, that, that is essentially the word used preload of the bike, it happens a couple of ways. First of all, is when you stand up fast, when you stand up quickly from a squatted position on the bike, your legs are going to push hard down into the pegs and you're gonna pull the bars to your chest. So that standing up action will make the bike crank like that. It'll squat the bike. It'll push the pegs down into the ground and your swing arm has to get into that position. It can't avoid it. The hard acceleration on the clutch, the tension in the chain is also going to make the bike squat. So the tension in the chain is gonna pull the bike down and make it help you squat into that position at that moment in time. So when we say squat in the exercise, it's just lowering yourself down to the start point. That's all it is. It's not about jumping down, it's just lowering yourself to the start point. It really is just that simple in the, in the process. I can see Sue going, <laughs> riding through the process. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it is interesting when you go through this process and you're delivering it to riders. It's very simple to show it, explain it, but then to put it into action is way harder than you think. Way, way harder than you think. But once it's in place, it's there with you forever. You'll, you'll basically never lose it. The last, the last of the three points is the go point. Now, I literally just say go because a good... 80% of riders will just naturally do the correct thing when we just say go, just release the clutch, go. <clears throat> What's actually happening in that moment within the go is first of all, the rider's gonna start standing up. They'll start standing up on the bike, which is gonna help the bike squat down into that position as they stand up. And then a moment later, they're gonna release the clutch. And it actually happens in that order. And normally I would just tell riders, it's rev, squat, and then go. And like I said, 80% will just go. The 20% that don't, I then have to pull them aside and say, hey, stand up, then release the clutch and, and do it in that order. And then they will pick it up from that. And I've had a, fair, a pretty good success rate in coaching sessions delivering that and, and getting them to that way. Now, the go is, people get a little bit confused when they, they initially say, well, how much do I go? How much do I release the clutch? Is it a complete dumping of the clutch and letting go of it? It's not, it's actually, it's a controlled release. So it depends on the obstacle. Initially in the early stages, you're not going to need a really aggressive release on the clutch because you're not going to be riding really steep, big obstacles. At first you might have something that's a little more ramped out. Um, it's good to, good idea, I'll explain in a moment, to start this exercise on a hill and you'll drive into a hill, so you've got something to, to let, let your steam off into, for want of a word. And as the obstacle gets steeper and steeper and more vertical to undercut, to, to heavily splatting, that's when you start to, to get really aggressive on the clutch and the RPM is much higher and more aggressive. But until you get to that point, you don't need to. The clutch release can be smooth to start with, and then over time you can gradually pick it up and make it a faster and faster release on the clutch. So. That's the, that's the overall process of rev, squat, go. Now, it's, it's a fairly simple, very simple one. Once it's in your head, it's very easy. It's a really good pattern to learn. It'll stay with you for life. It underpins all obstacle riding. Um, you can use it on really steep hill climbs. You can use it in and out of creek beds. You can use it in a hundred locations. I in a hard enduro, I would literally use this 
a thousand times in the day. A trial, the same thing. We will use it endlessly all the time. Now, how do you put this into action? That'll be the next thing. Is there any other comments at all? No. Nothing at all? No. no. Um, oh, do you need the computer I back? No, I just needed a mouthful and a, a breather. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, we need a coffee We need a coffee runner, don't we? We need a barista. Oh, I wonder who's here that could be a barista. <laughs> Which, do well, I don't know because my husband didn't even. sliding back in the. I was going to say, my husband didn't even make me a cup no, no, of tea we don't for need, the show. Do, I don't need. Oh, I was going to. I was oh, oh, I was going to. Yeah, no, you've thought about yourself. You didn't think about me. No. So the next, the next process is how to put this into into action. Now, putting it into play is probably the most important part. That's that's essentially the theory of it. Putting it into into play is quite simple, but pretty much every rider rushes ahead on this, and they will want to move ahead too quickly. Even I have realized, I mentioned it in the other show the other day, the big five things I've learned this year, is that I need to break things down further again and, and not necessarily break things down further, but spend more time on each component and absolutely drill it into the riders' heads before they move on. Because I've really this year come to understand the importance of developing the pattern in your head. So when you recognize the pattern, um, it'll never be forgotten. I have mentioned this before, but I, I was listening to some random podcast and the guy on there was talking to a fellow who was a previously a Google engineer. Um, Google? Google or Apple, one of those. And he, they were talking about computers and they were saying that a computer is still way behind the human brain in recognizing patterns. So the computer can do all the other things, but the human brain can recognize patterns way quicker than any computer out there, mm. apparently. So that could be totally out of date now. But, um, but our brains are really good at recognizing patterns and if you give it what it wants, it's gonna be easier for you to learn and it will be easier to retain for the long term. And do you think it would be better for the people who are having troubles trying to develop that pattern from the YouTube thing, I was not YouTube, I'm trying to think about the podcast I was listening to last night, where yep. you've got to label your behavior for that pattern. It's getting a bit complex. I know it's getting a bit complex, but it kind of makes sense that if you can say you're having troubles with the letting go, oh, you can yeah, label yeah. that behavior. And then she says you can proceed further. It's very interesting. Yeah. I'll put it up in the comments yeah. if I can find so it. So when you, when you do this, for me, the big one is, I guess essentially you are labeling it if you break yeah. it down into the small little pieces and focus on it. So the first, the first one, and this is one I talked about the other day that I didn't really appreciate how big a fact this is. Sue, I believe you'll 100% back me up on this one, and I think Darren as well. Um, when the, the anxiety riders feel when they start revving their bikes, and the moment you start revving, your heart rate's gonna rise. And it's amazing how quickly we suddenly wanna do things and we start rushing everything but we need to get past that anxiety. So the first step is literally just putting two markers on the ground and at the first marker, revving the bike, but keeping the slowest pace you can manage with your balance. So the slowest speed that you can possibly go while still maintaining balance in a straight line, revving the bike, but holding that bike back, holding the speed down to that very low speed, just creeping along, but controlling and managing the clutch, the, the speed completely on the clutch. That's the first point. And we want to get past the point of being anxious whatsoever about that RPM. And it is way worse and it is, it is there, even when you don't realize it's there, you need to take it further than what you expect. That part is really, really important. Once you've got past that, the anxiety, once you've done that a good 20, 30, 40, 50 times, then what you can start doing is releasing the clutch at the end of the second set of cones. So the first set of cones is RPM comes on. Second set of cones is the clutch release. Now, when you release the clutch, just feed it out slowly, which you're going to be doing whilst you're building, um, getting over the anxiety of the bike revving. But hold the RPM on and then feed the clutch out slowly and smoothly. And just, just keep doing that over and over again until you're completely comfortable and... Um, um, comfortable. Totally comfortable with it. And you've now got the pattern embedded into your brain? No? Oh, God, I Chicken. keep forgetting her name. I keep saying it. Patricia? Keep, no. Beverly? 
She wrote, Monica. did coaching with us the other week and she flipped her bike in the enduro coaching. Cynthia. Harriet. Harriet. Harriet, um, Harriet Bishop will let you know on that one. You, you don't release the clutch too quickly in the very early stages of developing this. So oh, just don't worry. feed I, the clutch I, out I think slowly. I learned that one from my section back at Pinjara. In Pinjara. Yes. <laughs> so you're going to get over that anxiety, start releasing the clutch, get comfortable with the clutch release. When you've got all that in place, get that absolutely dialed. Then you can put in a, a third set of cones in between the other two. So there'll be three sets of cones. And the first one is the revving. The second one will become the squat. And the third one is that go point, the release on the clutch. And what I'll do is I'll get riders to rev the bike at the first set of cones. The second set of cones is where you lower yourself to the start position. So you, you squat down on the bike and then you need to stay there until you get to the last set of cones. And at the last set of cones, you can feed the clutch out. Now at first, just do revving, lowering yourself to that start point or squatting, and then a gentle release of the clutch. And as you get more comfortable, we increase the release of the clutch and we increase the amount of standing up that we do in the go. And when you stand up, you wanna pull the bars to your chest and feel the bike start to lift. And when you get this right, you'll notice how quickly the bike just lifts underneath you. And it pretty well doesn't matter what bike you're on. Like you can ride any adventure bike, trials bike, enduro bike, whatever bike you ride, it'll happen very quickly and very easily. It'll just lift up underneath you. So when you get that right, wheelies will just become an absolute walk in the park because it'll, the front wheel will lift and the bike will kind of settle out on the back tyre nicely. Sorry, can you there. just say so, that again? No, I don't want to. Because... Wheelies? 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 Oh no! Oh, wheel look. lifts. Oh, wheel. Are you looking at the thing? Normally, the Facebook al um, auto auto yeah, text. Yeah, it's come likes up to... with wheelies. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, it gets there. Um, so that's how you put it into into place. The big regressions that riders make. First one is reverting back to accelerating on the throttle. We'll see riders will come in and they will be riding the clutch, and whilst they're riding the clutch, the throttle will be doing this and they're actually riding on the throttle and not um, maintaining everything on the clutch. We want to essentially hold the throttle, hold it in position and do all the adjustment, all the correction on the clutch only, not the throttle. So that's the first big regression. The second one is, is that people will start preloading or pushing hard down into the bike. And the third one is, is instead of squatting down and standing up, people will start to rock forward and rock backwards. And they'll rock their body forward and backward rather than going down and standing up with the bike for the go. So. Uh, now, Scotty Chapman also wants to know, would his ninja be able to do rev squat though? Road bikes are a little bit different because they're set up to go that way so much. They're a little bit harder to do. You, it's, much, it's much easier to go just revert to brute force and ignorance, get some more power but it does work with them. You go about it slightly differently on the big bikes. So you use a bit of momentum to assist you to get that back wheel squat, so. Mm, interesting. So, but the technique is, is essentially the, the same. The principle's the same. We just go about it a different way, so. Nice. Cool bananas. Well, that is pretty much all of the topic and we've done it in 42, 42 minutes. minutes. Done all right tonight for time. I know. Um, we had allocated an hour. Um, if you have any more questions on this, by all means, jump in the comments. If you're, re if you're watching this two weeks later, three weeks later, whatever, comment away. We'll try and respond to them wherever we can. And um, yeah, other than that, do you have anything else to add? Nope. Nothing at all? Nope. Thank you for letting me use your computer, though. That was very generous yes, of you. Yes, that is. I don't know what's going on with that, but it wouldn't be one of our shows without some sort of technical glitch. No. Anyway, guys, we're going to leave it there for tonight. Um, if you are following us, we've got some awesome comment coming up, a comment, awesome content coming up in the next couple of months. Um, and it's gonna have a bit of a series and process through here. So look forward to talking to you all about that. If you're interested, jump on the app, um, follow us on Facebook, make sure you like and subscribe and all that jazz. Share the love. And we'll talk to you all next week. Make sure you ride better, ride different and get on the gas. Catch us later. Bye. Ciao.